Hi, my name is Kevin Feenstra. I grew up in West Michigan, which is home to many rivers, lakes, and streams. Uh, I grew up watching TV about fishing and reading books and was probably more inspired by people like Jimmy Houston and Roland Martin growing up than any of the big fly fishing names you'd hear right now. Oh, there's a fish. I wanted to tell you how I got started in this and to take you through the different parts of a river and the different things that live in a river and hopefully give you a good foundation for fishing throughout the year. When I started fishing, I was fishing on a little tiny creek called Buck Creek in West Michigan and it, that creek had some environmental problems and unfortunately some chemicals were spilled in that creek. It's now a pretty strong fishery again, but after that happened, as a young teenager, I started looking for places to fish. One day while I was watching a TV program on a Saturday morning, which is what I did all day watching fishing programs for as long as they were on, I saw a guy catching a steelhead on a fly rod and I decided I wanted to learn how to do that too. Steelhead in Michigan are migratory fish here. There was very little information written about them and thinking that things were universal around the country, the books that I read were a largely West Coast books and a lot of the early fishing that I learned was how to swing flies, not knowing that it was something unusual for our area. There's a lot of West Coast flies that you could use for our migratory fish that work just great, but our waters are different, our fish are different. Generally speaking, our migratory fish have a lot less distance to travel, and so a lot of times they'll come into our rivers and they'll have a lot of time to sit. This course is going to take you through the different types of bait fish that we have. It's going to show you where they live. It's going to show you how we fish different bait fish patterns in different types of waters at different times of the year. Right now we're sitting here in February. Not too many people crazy enough to fish in Michigan in February. So even if you don't fish for migratory fish, learning a little bit about their habits can help your fishing for any type of predator fish such as trout or smallmouth bass or northern pike. This should have some pretty broad application. So I hope you enjoy this class and I know I'll enjoy teaching it. Good morning, everybody. It's February here in Michigan and it turns out today that it was raining in 33 degrees. And any of you who fished in 33 degrees and rain know that if you're gonna pick a day to be inside, this would be the one to do it. And so here we are. I'm gonna to talk to you about a seasonal approach to bait fish. Hopefully cut your learning curve because the things that are in this chapter weren't really obvious to me and they took a lot of time to learn. When I first started fishing our local rivers and when I first started fly fishing as a teenager, originally I was just throwing flies. I had no idea if they worked and then eventually I started hearing that I might wanna use a sculpin pattern which imitated a muddler minnow for example or any of the other little common bait fish like a Mickey fin or something like that. But as time went on, I started reading more and more and I got to know a little bit about the minnows and the bait fish that are in our local rivers. Uh, to be honest, even though I could tie what it looked like a sculpin from a picture, I had no idea what their habits were. I had no idea what they actually looked like underneath the water. I was catching a lot of fish with sculpin patterns. It was more by accident than by knowledge. There was a lot of times that what I was doing didn't work and I didn't understand why. Eventually I went underneath the water and I started out by just doing some shallow water photography and then I started snorkeling and I became really fascinated by what I saw underneath the river's surface. More and more I learned a little bit at a time. The very first day I went out and snorkeled I was shocked how little I actually knew and what was down there. Honestly how beautiful some of it is. Today I'm going to talk to you about the various seasons. I'm going to talk to you about the minnows that we have in our rivers in the fall and I'm going to talk to you about changes that we have in the winter and the minnows that we use in the winter season and then we're going to talk about spring where things radically change and we have a whole host of other different bait fish we imitate. Through much of the year, uh, much of the summer we fish, we don't talk very much about the migratory fish. Most of them are out in our big lakes, the Great Lakes. The water temperatures in a lot of our rivers are a bit on the warm side and to be honest there's other cool things to catch in our freestone rivers. We have trout and in our rocky warmer rivers we have great smallmouth fishing. We give the migratory fish a rest through the summer and then as fall comes along we start to seasonally change into the types of 
flies for the migratory fish and type of water that we're looking for. Fall is a really interesting time. Migratory fish, steelhead, salmon, lake run brown trout, when they're out in our big lakes, there's a primary food source called an alewife. It's an invasive species, but it's a big shiny fish, a herring-like fish that's out in the Great Lakes. The survival and the success of our migratory fish largely revolves around our population of those alewives in the lake, although there's many other bait fish that they eat, such as smelt, gobies, sculpins, sticklebacks in the Great Lakes. As they move into the river systems, there's a lot of bait fish, but they're a lot different than what we have out in the Great Lakes. There is some crossover, but a lot of it's different. And when they first come into our rivers, it's typically late summer, early fall. A lot of the weed beds in the rivers have died, and there's big schools of what we call shiner minnows in the river systems. Shiners are kind of the same format as those alewives that are in Lake Michigan or in one of the Great Lakes. When they first come into the river, if we're going to imitate a natural species, we're probably going to be imitating a shiner at that time of the year. Shiners typically at that time of the year are congregated in three to six feet of water as the water's warm. Three to six feet of water is the ideal depth for swinging a fly or presenting a streamer pattern to a migratory fish. So that works out really, really well. It's a great way to attack our fish as they first come in the river. When migratory fish first come in, their numbers are pretty light. One of the really good things about those light numbers, even though there's fewer fish because the water is very warm for what they're used to. They're hypercharged fish. They're very, very active. A lot of times we're trying to tie a fly that is colorful enough that'll draw their attention. China fly patterns are a good start to this because, as their name implies, they're shiny. Steelhead can see a shiner pattern from a long ways away. A lot of times we're using a shiner pattern that has something like this, some really bright flash that imitates the belly of the shiner as the steelhead see it. And you could add that type of flash if you were fishing in Lake Michigan to an alewife pattern because it too would look shiny from the sides and bottom of the bait fish. That's true of a lot of the bait fish that live a little bit higher in the water column. A lot of them will have kind of a sheen to the underside of their body. At the same time of the year, we're also fishing a lot of flies that look like this, though they might generally be shaped like a bait fish or a shiner. Color-wise, they're a lot different. We're really just trying to draw an aggressive strike that draws a fish from some distance. But as we head into winter, things change and we become a lot more concise about how we're imitating the bait fish that are available at that time of the year. So as fall comes to an end, water temperatures start to change in just about every river around the Midwest, and we spend quite a bit of the year in the deep freeze. That's a big change for the metabolism of our fish and it makes the fish react to flies a little bit differently, but if you like to get a fish to eat a bait fish, the fish are still eating bait fish at that time of the year. And right now I'm gonna to talk to you about one of my favorite bait fish, and it's called a sculpin. And a sculpin is a bottom-dwelling bait fish. It's a lot of times referred to as a chameleon of fresh water. It can change its color to appear the color of the bottom, and a lot of times I tell people when they first come to a river, if they're having a hard time catching a fish, look at the color of the bottom of the river and tie a fly on because in almost every river, there's some type of bait fish that's using the bottom of the river as camouflage. In the case of sculpins, they use it not only to protect them from predators, but they're also predators of their own. They feed a lot on insect larvae. They'll eat small fish. They'll eat each other. They have a really big head. They have a really big mouth. They're what's called a benthic bait fish, which more or less means that it's a bait fish that lives on the bottom of the river. And the difference between that and say a shiner or the alewife we mentioned, the bait fish that live higher up in the water column and swim all over the place, a sculpin is stuck to the bottom for the most part because he doesn't have a swim bladder which can elevate a sculpin up and down. When a sculpin moves, it moves very quickly but it can only do that for a short distance as it raises off the bottom and then it drops back down because of gravity. Most salmon, steelhead, trout type species are shaped like a torpedo. They are more of an endurance runner, whereas a sculpin is more of a short sprinter. If a steelhead can lock onto the sculpin, he can usually outrun it and eat it. And that's true of a lot of these bottom dwelling bait fish. 
that don't have that swim bladder. As steelhead adjust to the cold water, they become more and more lethargic. But if you throw a sculpin, which a lot of times represents a really big meal, that's just enough to break the steelhead out of its slumber and to get it to come around. It's definitely among my most favorite bait fish to fish. One thing you have to take in mind whenever you're imitating bait fish is how the fish sees your bait fish. So if you're fishing on the bottom of the river, really close to the bottom and really slow water, as a lot of times you're doing in the winter, the bait fish pattern should imitate the color of the bottom, like we mentioned. If you're imitating it in a way that's above the fish, the fish are seeing the belly of your bait fish. And most bait fish have a lighter colored belly. In the case of a sculpin, it's usually a cream color, maybe a yellow or pinkish color, but it's definitely a different color. The shape of the fly is also important. Sculpins have a really big head. You can see this fly has a really big gnarly head. And then they taper down almost like a teardrop. And that makes them a really enticing meal. And the final component that I'm gonna to talk to you about a sculpin is that one thing that predators really love about them is that they don't have any scales. Scales are a defensive weapon for a, a bait fish, but a sculpin doesn't have any defense. If he gets caught, he's getting eaten because he does not have any protection whatsoever on his body. These are the things that make a sculpin really appealing. There's another bait fish that's equally appealing to the big predator fish we have in our rivers in the winter, and it's one that hasn't been there for very long. I mentioned to you when I first started snorkeling, I saw things that I would have never guessed. And at the time, I'd never even heard of it. And I was trying to get photos of sculpins. And I would see a bait fish on the bottom and I'd take a photo and I'd like, man, that doesn't really look like a sculpin, but I'm gonna roll with it. And when I got home and looked at the photos close up, I noticed that there, the river had been basically overrun with invasive species called a round goby. And round gobies came over from the Black and Caspian Sea on the other side of the world, they came in a tanker into the Great Lakes. They got free. We already had another invasive species called the zebra mussel here. And it turned out that gobies were natural predators of zebra mussels. And so they proliferated. Eventually they made their way into all of our rivers. They'll actually outcompete the native fish. It's not quite as pronounced in river systems. And so we still have a wide array of minnows, but gobies are very, very prominent. They're a huge chunk of protein that swims around the river. They're generally a tan color. And in the springtime, the males become a dark black color. They're voracious predators in their own right. They eat just about anything that comes along. And their real benefit as far as a food source is that they're just super, super abundant. Unlike a sculpin, which tends to hide underneath a lot of rocks and under gravel, a goby a lot of times will sit on top of a rock and they've got a kind of a cool Mission Impossible type fin on the bottom of their body which acts as a suction cup. And they can actually go straight up the edge of a rock and they can turn a right angle and you know make Tom Cruise jealous when they're doing it. So a round goby just by proliferation becomes a really good food source not only for steelhead, brown trout, resident trout but also all of our summertime fish like smallmouth bass and walleye, northern pike, everything eats gobies. They have a downside in that they outcompete native fish. There's a couple other things about them. Once in the river system, I, I really actually kind of like them because they have made a lot of our resident fish bigger and they've created another food source that I can imitate. But they too have a very big fat head. When you're tying flies that imitate gobies, a lot of times you'll put big eyes on them, typically bead chain or maybe some plastic bead chain. The shape of a goby is just like a sculpin, kind of a big teardrop shape. And typically the most common colors I tie them are tan, kind of a mottled tan and black or with a really big black head because in the spring, the male gobies start to get into their spawning colors, which is black. The problem with sculpins and gobies is that they have a huge head. <laughs> and if you're fishing an area where you have to sink the fly, that huge head makes it really difficult to get down to the fish. Fortunately, there's another native bait fish that they like to eat that's a lot smaller, thinner, and it's called a darter. And a darter is a member of the perch family. They're super abundant in a lot of our rivers. They come in a variety of shapes and sizes, but most of them are kind of in that olive, bluish green spectrum 
Some of them are tan, a log perch or a Johnny darter, kind of in that earth tone range. Whenever you are fishing in the winter or any other time of the year, the earth tone range, olive and tan, if you have olive and tan in your box, chances are there's something eating those. And because of their thin profile and their small size, not only can we tie some weight into them and get them to sink really easily, but if I have somebody, for example, that's not very good at casting, a darter is a really good choice because they're generally small patterns. The other real benefit to using a darter pattern is that the resident trout, the smaller trout, love to eat darters. So those are kind of my big three for wintertime fishing. The, the sculpin, my favorite, the goby, and the darter, the nice slim bait fish. Not much changes through the winter months. The water temperature is hovering between 32 and a half and 36 degrees. It's very cold water. As you can imagine, there's not much that changes from a bait fish perspective. Most of the resident bait fish have settled in. The sculpins and gobies and darters, they're all underneath the rocks, but there's not much that changes. It's not like the spring months where you have hatches every day and things are really interesting and constantly changing. In the winter, it's pretty much a fishing experience from day to day as far as what's beneath the river. And then suddenly one day, the river gets to be above 38 degrees, 40 degrees, and you look at the edge of the river and lo and behold, what's happened is that from underneath the rocks in the middle of the river, these little tiny stone flies are migrating towards the shore and wiggling in the current. And that sets off kind of the activity of the bait fish in the river. The fish will start to work up the food chain and they'll start eating those stone flies and the minnows will also be eating the stone flies and that makes them active. And when the minnows are active, such as shiners and things like that, then the steelhead and the brown trout will also start feeding on those bait fish and on the bottom of the food chain, the stone flies. And so all of a sudden you have this cascade of activity at that exact same time, when the stoneflies are wiggling in the current, the eggs of the salmon, which were laid way back in October, the king salmon or possibly coho salmon in the Midwest, maybe even pink salmon if you go really far north, as they hatch in that little bit warmer water, that even increases the activity more. Those little fry that hatch out of the gravel are very weak. A lot of times they'll be hiding in the little pockets of the gravel or as soon as they catch the current, they'll go to the side of the rivers, often hiding behind some of the trees and branches that are in the river, just trying to gain a little bit of size. Salmon don't stay in the river for very long. They grow very quickly. Typically within a few weeks, they're an inch or inch and a half long, and they hover in that size range for a while, and that becomes the bread and butter of our fishing for quite a while. Sometimes we'll swing flies that look like these little salmon fry, they don't move around very much or very quickly. So you can twitch a fly through the edge of the river and catch trout and maybe a drop back steelhead. Or you can nymph them along the bottom or you can use them with some weight on your sink tip. This is an example of about an inch, inch and a half long fly that we use an awful lot. I can't tell you how many hours of my life have been spent tying patterns that look something like this. This fly has kind of a funny name. We call it Better Than Spawn. I had a couple really good bait anglers had gone through a hole that I was fishing with my clients. It was a busy day and I really didn't have much choice, so I fished the run kind of behind them, even though I knew that it had been fished by really good anglers. And lo and behold, we caught a couple steelhead on this fly. And my client turned to me and said, that fly's better than Spawn. And I said, why, yes, it is better than Spawn's. That's what we've called it ever since, but it's a small articulated fly. If you ever look at little salmon swimming in the water, their tail really wiggles in the current. A lot of times we're trying to give them that action, whether it's something that has the movement built into it or whether we're adding the movement by twitching it. Salmon fry make up a big part of our fishing, really the vast part of our fishing through a couple months in the spring. Even when I'm tying a tractor flies and trying to catch fish swinging, you would think that in the spring as the water warms, we'd be using bigger and bigger flies. In a lot of the rivers that have these salmon fry, they will actually shrink just about any pattern we use down to the size category of these fry, or maybe just slightly larger, because everything in the river is eating these really vulnerable fry that are in the river. Soon these salmon get bigger and bigger, and they still are very appealing bait fish 
to anything that's in the river by mid-April and into May. And all the way till June, we'll have little baby steelhead that are now hatching. If your river is capable of the reproduction of steelhead, you'll have a lot of little baby steelhead, and they also look very similar to a little baby salmon. The only difference is little juvenile steelhead initially are a lot more compressed. They're a little bit stouter and fatter than your typical king salmon fry, which might be a little longer and thinner. So those are primary food sources. As spring goes on and the migratory fish start to clear out of our rivers, they feed really heavily on eggs, but not on salmon or steelhead eggs. Most of our rivers have runs of migratory suckers. The river system that I'm on has multiple species of suckers. Some of them look pretty good. Some of them are kind of an ugly fish, but they all lay bazillions of eggs in our river. There's nothing that steelhead love to eat more than a nice juicy sucker egg. Sucker fry are usually a little different color than the steelhead and salmon. They tend to be almost a little lavender or purplish color. So a lot of times we'll swing little lavender colored flies through the edge of the river. And eventually at that time of the year, there's one other phenomenon that happens late in the spring. And that is that we have a type of mayfly that hatches called an isonychia. And isonychia are one of my favorite mayflies. They hatch as kind of a big clumsy gray mayfly, but in order to do that, they have a swimming nymph that swims towards the surface like a small minnow. And so a lot of times with that little sucker fry, we can imitate not only a sucker fry, but also those isonychia nymphs, which are struggling to the surface and fish really good as a wet fly. Those are the things we look for in the spring. It really adds to your fishing if you can think of the different types of species that are not only there every day, but the ones that are being born of migratory fish that might be in the river. So I talked to you about fishing in the spring and I showed you this little fly called a better than spawn, a BTS. Looks like this. Throughout Midwest, something that's been very popular over the years is a fly that's called a hex, hex nymph or a hex wiggle nymph. And a hex is a big mayfly that lives in a lot of our rivers, but it doesn't live in all of our rivers. And for example, the river that I'm on, the Muskegon, has a very spotty population of hexes. It wouldn't be a primary food source for our migratory fish, except in these very small restricted area. And yet, no matter where you go on our river system, you can catch fish with a hex nymph in the spring and all through the winter. I just wanted to make a point with this, and that is that migratory fish and also the resident trout are looking at this little hex wiggle nymph, and it's shaped almost exactly like a fry pattern. In a beautiful way, you're imitating two food sources rather than just one when you're making your fly tying. And I do this all the time because I'm almost 50 years old and I tie flies at least five nights a week. And there's certain times a year that I'm consuming a lot of different flies and I'm trying to imitate a lot of different things. So as you can imagine, if I can find a pattern that imitates more than one fish at a time, I can be really successful as an angler and at the same time, I'm making really good use of the time that I have. I do this not only with steelhead and salmon fry imitations, but I'll tie darter imitations that are nice slim and also about an inch and a half long. The beauty of it is that I can imitate not only a darter, which lives on the bottom of the river, but I can also imitate a salmon fry with that fly. If you put the two side by side and you look at them, a darter and a salmon fry actually look a lot alike. And so I'm always trying to find a way to blend different food sources into a way that migratory fish will eat them. Anytime you can, you want to kill two birds with one stone or maybe three birds. There might be a few different things that you're imitating generically with a pattern. And that's really the philosophy behind a lot of my fly tying. Now we've looked at the different seasons and the different types of bait fish, and you've got a pretty good idea of what we're looking for now. We're going to move into a section where we're talking about how to actually pick a river apart, how to read the water. And this section will help you to know not only what bait fish are there, but also where and how to read the water and learn from our experience. So we'll see you on the water and enjoy this coming section.